I was having a, I was having a bit of a nightmare about this, uh, like, you know, a waking morning nightmare, because I was remembering all the good things you said last time. I thought, oh, I've got to make sure we get those again. So... We are, I'm going to say, back in the studio with Chris Conway because uh, thanks to the gods of the internet, this is our second attempt. So, Chris, thank you so much for persevering, for coming back to the studio, uh, and maybe just tell everyone uh, who you are and where you work. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Chris Conway. I look after the e-commerce businesses at Co-op Food. Uh, that's a very uh, brief and succinct intro. Uh, so, tell us more. Uh, about why that's really impressive. Co-op food, how big, yeah, where be it? Sure. Most people have a co-op near them. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, jo- I joined the co-op in 2018. So I've been there nearly three years. And I I was tasked with really trying to start and understand our our journey in the digital space because we you know, we were a late mover in, in selling food online. So we didn't have any online businesses. So it's been a fantastic and enthralling journey of building up a number of uh, small, you know, relatively small businesses at the time, but obviously our growth has exploded in the last twelve months, along with along with the market growth, really. And you know, it's been it's been a fascinating journey. I guess before joining the co-op, I spent a couple of years at Morrison's running their online business, and then I spent fourteen years at ASDA. Before that time, uh, started out in retail stores as a shopkeeper, and then for my sins, uh, spent the last ten years of my time at ASDA in the e-commerce world eventually looking after the commercial side of that online business as well, quite a large e-commerce online business. So overall, I've been in e-commerce, uh, grocery retailing for about 15 years now. Uh, so Chris, look, it's um, a lot of people in e come from a technology or a marketing background, uh, but you've really done soup to nuts across the gamut of, uh, of grocers. Um, w- what perspective do you think that gives you now that you're in charge of e-com? Um, are, are you a different type of e-com director than you would have been had you come from a marketing or technology background, or am I just making that up? No, I, I, I think I think that's probably true, Ian. I, I'm really proud of the fact that I'm a shopkeeper at heart, and I, I say that a lot internally because I think that resonates with a lot of people who generally run uh, grocery businesses. So... Ultimately, the, you know the the, the role of, of selling baked beans is is similar, <laughs> whether you're selling them online or whether you're selling them in a shop. Essentially, we're just trying to sell stuff to customers, and we're we're trying to sell more of it, and we're trying to sell it in more exciting and interesting ways. Uh, mm. So I, th- I think that really does help. I think obviously, throughout my career, I've 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 had I've experienced marketing roles and experienced technology roles, and uh, you know run large tech projects and stuff like that. So. I think you know that that that's been that's been a a kind of bit of experience that I I I've earned and learned along the way. But I think at, at, at the core, it's an operator. It's getting products from A to B, and then eventually to to the consumer. So I think that's that's really what's important. And I think what's really what's really hard about grocery online retailing is, is the profitability of the channel. And you know that really comes mm. down to each in you know making as much money out of each individual product. You've got to move product from a warehouse or a store via a courier or via a delivery provider uh, to a a customer. And there are various costs associated along the way of the life of that product. And I think if you can get a really sound understanding of of that, I think then you can make this work. Uh, That's even before you get to acquiring customers and converting customers and all the sexy, nice stuff that we that we absolutely love to talk about and do and get some loads of plaudits internally. But essentially, it's it's a product game, I think. It's interesting you say that because uh, in our coverage of the grocery sector, uh, we have uh, commented a number of times that, you know, this is when operations comes from behind the scenes to take centre stage and a curtain call. And, you know, we've noted uh, over the whole COVID uh, and multi-lockdown period uh, that, that no one seems surprised that grocers haven't broken. Um, how was it that you were prepared, coming, if you like, relatively late to the game, but yet nothing broke, thankfully? You were ready for it. How was that? Yeah, I, th- I think actually we're in advantage here, Ian, because because we, 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 were, we were building our business and, and uh, we, we built it from the ground up, really. So we built it 
in a very future focused way uh, and the technology stack that we built in terms of our cloud infrastructure I kind of you know the, the fact that we're able to kind of add capacity and 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 almost kind of tag on microservices when we need has has meant that we've been able to react really quickly so for 2020 we already had an aggressive plan of opening stores so you know from I know I've, I've spoken to you before Ian but I think we at the start of 2020 we had a big partnership with Deliveroo where we were we were picking out of 200 stores. We also had our own e-commerce business, which had just come out of trial really in 2019, and we were picking out of 32 stores. Good timing. So in total, it was two. In, in total, it was 230 stores. We had a we had a quite aggressive plan to add about 300 stores on in 2020, which would have taken us to over 500 500 stores at the end of 2020. And because of the pandemic and because of the extra pressures on capacity and the increased customer demand, we were able to pivot that really quite quickly. Uh, and because we had a proven kind of opening model, uh, you know, we've got to over 2,600 locations across the UK as a co-op. And, and some of them are relatively small stores and right. some of them are relatively large stores. So we have to be quite nimble in terms of how we operate and how we land this proposition. But essentially, we, we, we were able to roll out really fast. So we've, we've exited the year picking out of over a thousand locations now. So, you know, from an original plan of 300, we've uh -huh. gone to a thousand, which obviously has meant that we've increased capacity, you know, tenfold during that during that period of time. So therefore, we were able to cope mm. with, with, the, with demand. I think also, I think what, what was probably most difficult is is looking at the operation in store, because essentially it comes down to what a colleague does on a day to day basis. And because of the changing changing customer hab habits in the physical space. And you'll know this from walking around the centre of London. If you walked around a year ago, the co-op would have been full of people grabbing their lunch and, you know, it's, it's absolute chaos in some of the stores and the footfall is tremendous. And you'll go in the same stores now and you'll be lucky to see two or three people wandering around uh, some of these central London stores. And that's just a change in the way that people have, have, have started to operate and shop. And therefore, mm -hmm. it's meant that, you know, the, the hours that we had in store and the colleagues we had in store that were, were previously supporting customers in store, Actually, we've had to change their tasks and change their roles quite significantly. So now, actually, they've turned to the online uh, channel and task. So, you know, we've had to train colleagues quite quickly. We ha we've had to be quite nimble about how we do that and use remote resources to, to do that. But actually, our operational base and our retail colleagues have done a tremendous job in, in being able to change what they do. And as well as that, we've managed to increase our sales in some of these stores over time, you know. I think at the start of the pandemic, I think our top store was maybe doing five percent of online sales, you know, of their sales through online. And you know, we're we're breaking the record barriers almost weekly as we speak. And we've got some stores over the thirty percent, forty percent mark now, where you know they're almost becoming kind of you know they're almost to the fifty percent on online fulfillment center stage. And it's brilliant because you know we've been able to to really leverage the physical assets that we've got, which has really helped. Uh, let's talk about profitability, because you mentioned this uh, right at the beginning. Um, typically, from my naive external perspective, I would have thought the best way to make money out of grocery is £300 weekly shops at a solid margin delivered in a dense urban area. I would not have picked small shops, small baskets, uh, you know, with lack of predictability in and out of a local store with variable stock. So it sounds like you're profit focused, you're operational focused, but you've picked a really hard way of making money. So um, how, why do you have this local picking model rather than going with big dark stores or uh, big picking centers and going the sort of industrial way? Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Really, when when I when I joined the co-op, having spent, I used, like I said before, time at Morrison's and Asda, which is more traditional kind of big box retailing, I think I I spent the first kind of four or five months, spend a lot of time with our leadership team, a lot of time with our executive team, but also a lot of time in our stores, and really trying to understand the business and understand the customers and how they were different. And I think I quickly realised that uh, if we were to be successful in the online space, the last thing we wanted to do was to replicate what was already there. In terms of the big box model, and you know, having having run large P and Ls in that space before, I, I I absolutely understand the mindset of what we really need to do is is get customers to spend quite a lot of money, 
ideally we need them to we need 60 percent of their basket to be ambient 30 percent of it to be chilled and and the rest to be frozen so we can fit it in the van nice and carefully and we can get as many orders in the van as possible and then ideally we need them all on the same street so we can drop them off at the same time every day and Absolutely. and there are various methods in which you can incentivize customers to do that uh whether that's you know whether that's on site or through delivery charging, so you know absolutely that's what you would normally do in this space. And I think what I try to do is turn that on its head and say actually, if we allow the customers to choose how they shop rather than letting the retailer choose how they shop, what 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 will happen? Can we break the barrier almost? Can we kind of break the ceiling of penetration in grocery, which I think has been kind of strangled a little bit in the last few years, where you know it hasn't grown as much as as much as it should and when you compare it to other sect other retail sectors you know it's been relatively slow growth i would say in, in online food although it's a, obviously it's a huge market yeah, uh, yeah. you know it was stuck around the seven percent seven percent penetration mark and you know it might have gone to 7.5 last year with, with with a fair wind which is still good growth but isn't really setting the world alight and i my, my vision was you know, if we if we let customers choose how they shop, can we can we get a bigger share of their wallet? Can you know can we can we get them to shop more frequently? And you know, the, if you look at the frequency of online shopping grocery, it's quite a frequent thing that you do. But when I say quite frequent, it's probably a couple of times a month. So actually, you know, you only you only getting the benefit of that customer a couple of times a month, and they're shopping elsewhere in between to top up. So my my vision really was to say, you know. The co-op is a convenience retailer. We do really well at, at some great mission, you know, the top-up mission, the meal for tonight. And if we can bring that to to consumers, so actually they can pick up their phone, and they can order, and it can come in 30 minutes in, in some cases or in two hours in, in other cases. And, you know, I don't have to spend £40. I can spend 15 actually, which, it, which we've got a minimum order on our own e-commerce platform, but, but zero on, on delivery. And essentially... You're right. It's, it's a real challenge and a, and a bit of a kind of leap of faith here to say, you know, customers will spend a, a little bit more than that because they they like the service and they're used to the service. Uh, the way we set up operationally in store is that it's a variable task like anything else. So, you know, we haven't got rafts of people in our stores constantly doing a specific job. So where you go into a big box retail, you'll have a checkout operator and you'll have someone filling a particular aisle. Yeah you'll have someone else picking online orders. And that isn't how it works at our stores. You know, all, all our colleagues are able to do most jobs. You know, if they need to bake some stuff or they need to serve a customer or they need to fill up a shelf, they're able to do that. And equally, through the use of technology in our stores, we've got an application called Task Manager, which effectively manages our colleagues' tasks on a daily basis. And this is kind of a real-time kind of list of stuff they have to do. And we've been able to make sure that we interrupt that application with our online ordering as well so actually in some stores and this was the vision in, in some stores if that store gets two orders a day that's okay that's not a problem because the fixed cost of this operation is quite minimal so you know if two customers a day decide to order from that store and they want it delivered then, you know the colleague can can divert their task to pick the order quickly we can pay a third-party courier to deliver it at a fixed cost depending on how far they are away for, for, from the shop and and therefore we can really manage our cost base quite carefully because you know we only incur cost if we get an order. We haven't got this kind of raft of fixed costs. And had we invested in a dark store or fulfillment centre, we you'd, we'd almost be starting at a kind of base that meant that we almost, we had to pay for that depreciation. You know, the f the first million orders would have paid for that depreciation almost. So, you know, I think the idea here was. You know, we 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 start small, and we and but really we start quite nimble, and we do what we're best at, and that we're serving local customers because we're really close to them. You know, in our co-op food strategy is about being closer to the customer, and historically that's been about physically closer. So we are what shops do we want to build, or do we want to buy or acquire? And actually, we've we spun that on its head and said actually it's not just about our physical stores, it's about actually what's our online reach. And you know, again, if we if we surveyed the surveyed the UK. I said, actually, how many stores does Co-op really need to make sure we're really close to every single customer? Like I've already said, we've got over two and a half thousand. We probably need a couple of a couple of thousand more in reality, because you know we want to be yeah, within just... maybe 400, 600 meters of every single customer, and and that that would that would cost a hell of a lot of money and probably isn't possible. So actually, what online does it gives us that extra reach from every store, so we're touching new customers and. 
it, it, it might mean in the future that actually where we're looking, where we might want to build a store, actually we don't need to build a store because we've covered that conurbation or or density of population from our mm. from our reach. But back to your point about profitability, I, I think it's all in the margins, Ian. It's all it's all in the very very small bit per order. And if you know if you can make as many of the costs variable as possible, and I think and and move the products as effectively as possible I, th- I i think there's a real route to profitability here but i mean obviously it comes with scale as well so you know this isn't this isn't a day one uh profitability money tree absolutely not but i i do think you know we, we at scale we've got a, a, a great business here and i think it's one that our customers have really loved and that that, that, that growth obviously accelerated in in the last eight months so we're able to tick off some of our assumptions a lot quicker than we thought which is encouraging is it uh is there a ceiling on the what you can actually achieve on the convenience factor for your customers you're obviously committed to making it as simple as possible for them to order whether it's online or in the store or be there you know however they want to do it but you know that comes with that is operational uh costs you know the the complexity of of doing all of this sort of stuff is there a ceiling to that or do you really think that you can achieve anything i i, I don't think there's the ceiling because I think ultimately there's a market out there and, and people are deciding how they want to shop. And I think although although the pandemic has changed uh, patterns somewhat, so there's, you know, there's, there's going to be lots more work to be done to see how the market will react in the next few years. I think what I learned from the market data pre-COVID is that customers were operating in the online world very, very similar to how they were operating in the, in the physical world. You know, they were, they were, they, you know, when I was a kid, we'd go to, the local shop on a Thursday evening as a family, we'd fill two trolleys up, and uh, that would be that would be us from a from a week perspective. And we know that's just not how people are shopping now. They, you know, people are changing in the physical sense. And uh, as, as a business, corp has benefited from that changing behaviour. And I I do believe that's what we'll see online. And there's shoots of that in the market data. You know, pre COVID, you know, four or five years market data with basket going down online and frequency going up as people are. Are changing the way they they view it, how they shop online. So, you know, I think is there a ceiling? No, because we've got two thousand six hundred stores. I mentioned that a few times, but it really is the crux of how we want to operate. And we've we've opened stores now. So in central London, we you know within the M twenty five, we've got over two hundred and fifty stores as a, as a business. And you know, as as people's shopping habits change, the use of those physical stores is, is going to change as well. And is the customer changing as well? Because I uh, I have an emotional link to the co-op because when I was uh, but a wee young lad growing up in the valleys of South Wales, then I'd go shopping with my gran to the local co-op and get the green shield stamps and everyone knew everyone, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. W- what is your customer and has that changed? And is that change permanent or just a temporary artifact of COVID? Yeah, I, I think it is changing. I think you're right. I think from a from a demographic perspective, our our customers tend to be older. Uh, that's for, that's for sure. And I think historically, I, you can see me a, and Jamie going older. What's older? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're in that segment. Yeah, I'm being I'm being I'm being polite. Yeah, Old, older than our competitors. That's for sure. <laughs> I'll back up your point, Chris. Though I think the uh, shout out to the Great Bookham Co-op in Surrey because they've been a lifeline for my uh, parents-in-law whilst uh, during this process, uh, during this period. So uh, I think yeah, spot on. Yeah, and recently, yeah. Jamie, you've been allowed back in the store after those unfortunate incidents. We shan't discuss those again, <laughs> Ian. Yeah, I, 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 I did hear about that on the grapevine, but I thought I'd best bring it up in, in this. Session. The yeah, I think you know, I think historically our customers have been older, and I think it, it is a. It is a absolute strategy of ours to to change that over time, and I think if you if you if you go into some of our new stores that we've opened in the last few years, I think you see a massive step change in technology and customer offer, and that that you know that has been make, make, that has been ensuring and introducing our service to to younger customers, and I think that's that's been a big bonus. I think also physically we've been investing a lot in in the younger customer anyway, so. You know our our links with the NUS and Student Beans, etc., are really great. You know we offer all students a ten percent discount in our stores with their NUS, and that's worked really well. We've got a number of stores on uh, university campuses across the UK, and we've got a number of franchises that the right. you know the NUS have invested in with co-op, 
uh, where you've got co-op goods and services on, on student campuses. So that's really helping reintroduce co-op. And again, a lot of students I've spoken, spoken to at careers fairs and stuff like that, they've said to me exactly what you said, Ian. I used to go in the co-op with my mum and dad. I remember going in, but I haven't been in for years. And actually, once they go in, especially in one of the newer stores, they they kind of, re, you know, they they kind of almost kind of uh, reimagine what it was like. And they actually, it's brilliant because it's really easy. The products are great. The quality is fantastic. You know, we, we win lots of awards and all that kind of stuff, which is great. Uh, also, you know, I think the work we've done on festivals in the last couple of years as well. I know we haven't had any festivals during COVID, but pre-COVID, yeah. we had we had you know we had a co-op shop at uh, nine festivals in 2019, including Glastonbury, uh, where hundreds of thousands mm. of, of of revelers enjoyed vi- co- visiting the co-op and uh, going off with their co-op hemp bags and keeping them for life and tweeting about what a fantastic experience they've had you know all, all, all these things are absolutely not by accident but certainly our online introduction our, our, our business in our business introduction into online is absolutely targeting the customers that are on the go you know the the people that you know are, are shopping frequently a couple of times a week and they have they, they're a bit probably time poor or they were time poor so you know that that you know our our demographics of customer online are significantly younger uh, when compared to our store customers, although actually in the in the in the marketplace, the the the, the biggest growth in customers is in the older customer. Interesting. Well, look, um, let, let's maybe then link on uh, from that back to Deliveroo, but also at the same time, um, you haven't got everything in one basket. If you excuse the pun, uh, you're doing trials with Pinga uh, in East London yeah. and Buy Me. Uh, in Bristol. So, um, f- firstly, t- tell me about these partnerships with local delivery, and then why um, you know are you having all of these trials going on, um, and and what's the strategy behind multiple partners? So, Deliveroo, sure. and uh, then we'll talk to the other partners. Yeah, I think really it started when, when, when having spent this kind of four or five months in the co-op and understanding the business. It we you know there's, there's no getting away from it. We were late to the party, and you know we we had to look at how we how we move volume online really really quickly. And setting up your own e-commerce business, and you know the techno your own technology stack, a, a, you know an e-commerce platform, and and the, and the capability to do it uh, takes some time. So you know at at the time, you know delivery was an opportunity to partner with someone on quite a small scale initially. So we started a five store trial in Manchester. And we, you know, we trialed 300 products, uh, you know, predominantly kind of beers, wines and spirits and confectionery, that kind of mission, uh, just to see if customers liked it and if they ordered. Uh, and, you know, the, the quick answer is they really did like it. And we, we, we quickly changed that relationship to be a more strategic partnership. So, in, you know, at the start of, uh, well, kind of middle of 2019, uh, we, you know, I work really closely with Delivery. They're a fantastic partner, and you know, we agreed a more strategic partnership where we were their convenient strategic partner almost. And uh, what it meant was we uh, we agreed a enhanced, accelerated rollout, and also we were able to influence their product roadmap to try and you know move them a little bit, of, you know, to ensure that the the functionality on their application was equally favourable to grocery products as it is to kind of takeaway products. And there's been some enhancements in the last six to 12 months that have really helped us with that. But effectively, what it what it really means is it gives us access to lots of new customers immediately. It means we can showcase our great co-op products and, 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 and shift product quite quickly. Because of our locations around the UK, we were able to effectively go wherever Deliveroo go uh, and wherever they've got last mile capability. So, you know, the the relative ease of us doing that, you know, it wasn't easy, it was tough. And, you know, opening... Open, well, I think we're at nearly 600 stores with them now. That that isn't wow. as straightforward as it sounds. Yeah, you know, there's a bit of work involved in that. But actually, we you know, we've enhanced the range tremendously. We've done lots of tests. We've got over a thousand products now live on the delivery platform. Uh, you know, they're priced differently to store as well, and that's partly due to the cost of doing business with a partner. So, you know, we don't pass the, all the costs onto the consumer, but certainly in some categories, you'll pay more for products and for the convenience of getting it straight away. Uh, and, you know, the, the average order on Deliveroo takes 25 minutes from kind of clicking checkout, uh, going, to, going to the co-op, picking it and getting to, the, getting to the front door. So, you know, and the missions we see on Deliveroo are quite different. You know, 
at, at 10 o'clock at night, the, the products that people buy are a little bit different to what they do at, at 9 a.m. in the morning where we get the kind of breakfast rush. And, you know, we are seeing lots of that kind of behavior on Deliveroo. And Deliveroo absolutely is a key part of our strategy, in, in, certainly in the long term, I think. Our partners are a key part of our strategy, should I say, in the long term, because I think a healthy mix of channels and a healthy mix of partners not only spreads the risk, but means we can accelerate faster and have access to more customers. And, you know, we've done lots of internal measurement of, of the, the business we're doing with delivery. And we, you know, we believe most of it is incremental and, and supporting our our overall business strategy. So, you know, we're pleased with that. In terms of the other trials, yeah. uh, what we're really keen to do, and, and, and because we're able to do this, is we're able to move really, really quickly with all, all new partners. So where we see there's something exciting out there, we do want to be part of it and we want to be in at the ground. A, to share the data and share the learnings, but B, to try and give some of these people a bit of a lift and a leg up in the market. So, you know, by me is a really interesting one because they've done really, really well in the Republic of Ireland and they they did a fantastic job in Dublin and they've expanded with Duns across the Republic, and they were keen to set up a base in the UK, a uh, very kind of Instacart kind of model. And uh, again, we were keen to partner with them and, and and learn along with them. So, you know, the the stores that we opened in Bristol with, in partnership with them have, have been relatively relatively successful. So, we're, we, you know, we're monitoring that trial. The Pinga one in East London is is a bit different because there we are, rather than having a kind of traditional, I call it traditional, it's, it's not really traditional, but apart from having the kind of delivery by me model, which is a, a, a technology platform and, and self-employed couriers, Pinga is a bit more kind of community focused, I would say. And the fact that, you know, you, you don't have to be a courier, you don't have to work long hours. You can kind of turn yourself on as a Pinga partner for an hour or two and then do a couple of local jobs and then turn yourself off. And I think that kind of community kind of give gives something back. If, if you go into the shop, I'll have a coffee from Starbucks and, and you can get me the, these two things from the co-op, I think was quite interesting for us. So again, we, we, we're learning bits and pieces yeah. there, but it, you know, it's a relatively small trial. And, you know, the, the other really interesting trial that we, I call it a trial, but we've been working with them for two years now is, is, is Starship Technologies in Milton Keynes, where, you know, there we've been doing completely autonomous deliveries for quite a while now and you know we've expanded that service recently as well i can feel some of our listeners who are you know startups or technology suppliers are fainting uh, and then reaching for their keyboards to start mailing you now uh, because this is a very different partnership approach uh you know i want to learn together i want to give them a leg up to be honest Ian, in the last 12 months i've, sp- I've probably <laughs> spoken to about 15 to 20 similar types of businesses and I, I think I'm absolutely happy to do that. I think that's an important part of my job, important part of my role. And uh, if I was to ask the CEO of our business, was that my part of my job? They would say yes, because when, when I report back to the board, I, I, need, I need to let them know what's going on in the market. I need to, I need to let them know who, who's winning, who's losing, what's innovative, what's new. Should we be part of it? And you know, if, if I think we should be part of it, then I, I absolutely will, will do everything I can to enable that to happen. And you know the leg up bit is is a bit about being being a co-op as well. It's about cooperating. You know, our, our mission. You know, I don't know if you're one for visions, Ian, but our, our our vision is cooperating for a fairer world. And uh, believe it or not, we're 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 all targeted on that personally. So I think mm. my my role in that is is to look at how how we how we help startups, how we how we look to innovate. And you know, I think we haven't got time to talk about it today, but we we do have a we have a building in in Manchester called Federation which is where our digital product teams are, are based. But, but what we also do is we, we, we open up that space to local digital startups in the Manchester area, uh, you know, on a kind of not for, not for profit uh, rent basis. And, you know, we've done that for a number of years. This isn't, this isn't my, uh, yeah, my uh, idea, by the way, this is something that existed before I joined the court, but it's a fantastic. It thing is great. Do. And, you know, I think we've always been keen to do that. And yeah, you know, we've learned lots from it, and it's and it's enabled us to move forward. Yeah, no, I'll take that as an invitation so that uh, we'll come up. <laughs> no, I, I think we're full at the <laughs> moment. Ian. Jamie, Jamie. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Ian. So, Chris, I was just thinking about those, all those partnerships and any other of these cool trials you're doing. You know, how much uh, do you consider the loyalty factor when you are considering whether to roll out or, or stop, as it were? And, and generally, how big a role does loyalty play within the co-op offering? 
Yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're a cooperative, so we're a member-owned business. So uh, we don't have a loyalty scheme as, as such, but we have a membership scheme. So, you know, you pay a pound to be a co-op member, which effectively means you own part of the business. Uh, and obviously, if you spend over £250 a year with us, you get invited to our AGM. And you get you get a vote, and you vote in our executive directors, etc. So you you know I think that's that's really important to us. Obviously, like any any uh, scheme uh, in inverted commas, uh, as being a membership scheme, uh, you know our, our members are our most loyal customers. You know they 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 shop more frequently, they generally spend more with us, and absolutely they're the ones that help us decide where the community money goes. Mm-hmm. So. By being a member, it means that every product you, every co-op product you buy, a percentage of that, so two percent of that uh, value goes into the local community fund for that store. Half of which goes to the local causes that our member, our local members pick. The other half goes to other causes that's decided by our membership council. So, you know, I think loyalty is is important, but you know, we certainly don't call it loyalty internally. You know, these are our members, and you know, they're they're our most loyal customers, and. We're there to serve them, and and you know, we are a commercial business. We need to make make money, and the reason we need to make money is so we exist for our members, and that that's how that's how we operate. So, uh, mm. it, it is because Ember wrote a story, uh, oh, I think last month or something that yeah. said um, that you'd introduced a membership app that had been downloaded, oh, I don't know, a million times or something uh, within the year. So, what is it you're offering them um, in the app? Uh, that is so persuasive to them. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it, it's it's a way of them keeping abreast of, of of their balance. So when they spend in the co-op, they're able to use a di- you know, they they're able to use the app as a digital card, so they don't need to carry the physical card around, which is a big bonus. Uh, they're all, they're also able to track uh, how much is going to the local cause and how much is going into their digital wallet, which is fantastic. And also, they're able to pick and change their local causes within the app. Also, every week there there's a selection of personalised offers for every member as well. So on a Monday you'll get a push notification, and you're able to select two or three offers from a list of offers that have been uh, personally selected for you. And obviously that means that you you know, you're using the app more regularly, more frequently. You're able to peruse the offers, and some of those offers are a traditional uh, X amount off a basket, and some of them are are fifty p off a certain group of products or or a product and uh, I think that that breeds a frequency and loyalty, and uh, that's it, that's important across not just online but all, all our business. And you know, introducing the e-commerce shopping experience into that app is 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 a is a big is a big project for us, and and one that landing very very shortly. So we're you know we're quite excited about that as well. Is there a critical sort of uh, KPI that you put down that relates to membership, as in? that it's good for membership, that it's helping its members out. Is that one of the key ways in which you judge one of these partnerships over and above? Does it pay for itself? Does it, is it efficient? All those other things that you might think about. The, the easiest way of explaining it is it, it, it's our mission to give more people access to the co-op. So, you know, by, by these trials and, 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 you know, not just these trials, but the festivals that I already spoke about, the, the, new, the new franchises within, within, our, within our NUS uh, partnership, the the you know the the wholesale customers we now supply you know following our acquisition of Nice so you know we also supply over four thousand independent shops with co-op products now so you can you can go into your cost cutter or or your Nicer and find co-op products in there so all that is around actually sharing out uh, the co-op products and and getting people more access to them and getting them to try them because we you know we really believe they're fantastic so you know the more we can do that online as well the better thanks that Chris now we. We've talked uh, tangentially about values and ethics and so on. Uh, And I just want to maybe pick up on fair trade and the supply chain security uh, and so on. uh, Obviously, the co-op has not just recently, but for decades, uh, been involved with. So how do you get um, involved with uh, things like traceability, transparency, um, ensuring your supply chain is not just efficient, but also ethical. Uh, you know, does that fall under your remit or how do you work with the teams there? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't fall under my remit, Ian, no. But I mean, we, we have a fantastic team who, who, who looks after that. So I think you, you, you probably know that the co has a long-standing 
commitment to fair mm-hmm. trade. So whether, whether that's in coffee or chocolate and, and and things like that. So you know we 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 you know we we do believe we're a true kind of industry leader in in that space. Also in in, in sustainability mm. as as well. I think from a supply chain perspective, we've got a a, a, a very large team who who work for our commercial you know our, our kind of chief commercial officer. Uh, that in, in, ensures the traceability of all our products, and you know things things like on on meat, where you know we we were the only supermarket to have completely British meat. And are you seeing online that uh, people are using that for choice? Yeah, I, 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 I think we're seeing that grow. Uh, obviously, it's growing at a large pace, but from a really small base, I would say. So it, 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 it's still not the overriding mm-hmm. thing that customers are, are are searching for, but it, it's certainly you know more than twice as important as it was at this time last year. So I think that there's a real accelerated curve of of that. And I think it will become more important in the, in the next few years, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, look, we have covered a lot today. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate your candor. And also so lucid. Um, literally, you've just been writing my articles for me. So thank you for that. What is it that you're thinking, I can't wait to crack on with project x or program y what, what, what's the exciting thing the cherry yeah. on your cake for 2021 yeah i've got to be, this is where i've got to be careful about what i what i share with you. And we, i mean we've got you've, you've you've seen from what we've done the last 12 months we it's we, just you know, it's just me jamie and our one listener yeah of course of course yeah so yeah i think you know we, we're, we're going to accelerate we're going to put our foot down and we you know although we're in over a thousand stores we've got another 1600 stores to get after so there's some basic uh targets we've got there to give more people access to the service so we're we're, we're really we're really going to get on that i think also there's some remote areas where we've done we've done a good job this year of you know some of the islands in scotland and the isle of silly and uh, the isle of man etc we've done a good job of, of of supporting those communities during covid and, and, and turning on the service but we want to continue that good work across the rest of the uk which we're quite excited about uh we've got lots of technology enhancements to make it easier i think uh, you know, I think I, I don't make any apologies probably for the last 18 months being focused on access to the service. And we focused a lot of our technology and a lot of our our mindset on to making sure that more people can access the service. I think I think 2021 will be much more around the engagement of our customers and the customer experience that they they encounter whilst whilst, you know, shopping with the co-op. And I think internally, the biggest challenge for me is how I support the transformation of the business. So, you know, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but mm-hmm. I do see my role as a tran- transformer in chief, I think I like to call it, where, you know, I, I need to work really, really closely <laughs> with our executive team internally and our leaders internally to, to see how the bit, to, to see what the operating model should look like in the future, because it, it's clearly got to change. You know, our supply chain has got to change. Our distribution has got to change. Our, our retail operating model has to change. You know, the the way we recruit customers, the way we... We, we recruit colleagues, the way we train, uh, you know, the, I think there's such a, such a lot to get after. And, you know, we've, as a business, we've been, we've been around over 175 years now and, you know, we've done a lot of good things in that time and we've got a lot of good processes in place, but actually, you know, I think we need to step change the way we operate as a business to make sure that we're fit, fitter for the future. And, uh, our, luckily Great. our CEO is spearheading that change and he's, is the is the biggest flag bearer for that change? So I'm I'm pushing against an open door, but I very I very much see it as my role to be the instigator and the challenger in that internally. So that's probably the biggest thing for me personally. Wonderful. Well, that that sounds like a full 2021. Uh, so Chris, I appreciate you uh, giving us many attempts to record this. So uh, massive thanks for your perseverance, uh, but also your openness. You know the. Um, I think behind all the engineering prowess, uh, you know, grocers in the last year in particular have become essential workers, frontline staff. And I think a beacon of where values and commerce and community can all come together. So uh, a massive thank you. Uh, It's been an absolute pleasure as ever chatting to you. So uh, we wish you every success in those projects the rest of the year. Thank you so much, Chris. No problem. Thank you very much. Speak to you soon.